Hi everyone, welcome to our second webinar with the Farm of Francesco that is entitled, What does a Laudato Si Farm look like? We are super happy to be holding this and, and having this webinar in a very important week for all of us, that is the Laudato Si Week. So happy Laudato Si Week for, for all of you. And, and today our session is going to be, um, we are going to be having a special speaker that is Austin. Austin is the, the author of uh, the book, Let Us Dream, among other books. And we are going to have a session similar to the previous session that we had together for those that could join us, that is going to be a co-created session. So feel free to, as we go in the presentation, to share your comments, to share your questions in the chat. And we are going to have a special moment to, to open for Q&A and having you like joining us if you would like to speak or with your comments at the end of this session. So the way that the session is going to happen is that uh, Austin is going to be presenting. Then we are going to have a moment with uh, three discussants that are joining us especially today to ask a direct question to, to Austin and, and co-create the discussion. And then we will have the moment for the Q&A all to air. But before we do that, um, as this is a special week, and as you all know, like Parmo Francesco is very much involved in Laudato Si and Laudato Si Action Platform. We have uh, Mateo with us, that is uh, part of the Farm of Francesco. And I forgot to introduce myself, but my name is Maria Virginia. I am from um, Argentina, part of the Farm of Francesco, serving as co-leader together with Mateo. So uh, Mateo, the word is yours. Thank you, Maria Virginia. And um... As it has been uh, said just now, I would like to spend uh, three, four minutes uh, setting the context and explaining what Farmo Francesco is and uh, why are we meeting in this special week. Um, the Farm of Francesco, uh, and I guess many of, of those present in this, in this very webinar, um, have a lot of things in common, one of which is that we have heard and we have responded to the cry of the earth, cry of the poor call of Pope Francis, uh, who's the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm sure Austin can talk much more eloquently about um, who the Pope is, but I think Pope needs no introduction. Um, and two of his encyclicals, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti, elaborate on this very call, which in the view of the Farm of Francesco is a, a social call. Uh, those are social encyclicals. We are not talking about environment per se. I mean, we are talking about environment, but environment is not um, um, at the center of Pope's uh, call. So Pope Francis has heard and now is inviting all of us to, to answer this, this call. That is happening uh, via numerous platforms, one of which is Economy of Francesco. This is where Maria, me, and uh, numerous other youth have met, some of which have created the Farm of Francesco. So Economy of Francesco, in our understanding, is uh, one of the processes the Pope and his team initiated in order to not only issue the call, but gather momentum that is answering this call. Um, and so Economy of Francesco is a uh, right now a community that was supposed to firstly meet in Assisi in March 2020. This is why this very photo is there. But as we all know, pandemic has struck us just a few weeks before and we couldn't meet. Um, so the event, uh, what was an event back then, turned into an online process uh, and some face-to-face -face meetings uh, last year. Um, that despite the odds, uh, were answering Pope Francis' call to, to imagine and, and implement new fraternal economy. Economy of Francesco was and is divided in so-called 12 villages, which are groups of people who are passionate about certain topic, like agriculture in our case, uh, that is trying to uh, connect this word like agriculture with something that usually doesn't go together with that very industry, like justice in the case of agriculture and justice village uh, that uh, both Maria, me and, and, and others who have co-founded Farmo Francesco um, um, are in. And that's what brings me to the Farm of Francesco itself. Farm of Francesco has emerged or been created within this um, process of answering Pope Francis' call within the economy of Francesco. 
and um, and and our objective is to, as I said at the very beginning, continue answering this call and support others, farmers in particular, with answering call of Pope Francis. One other um, initiative of the Holy See that is worth mentioning here uh, that we would like to spend a minute or two uh, talking about um, is Laudato Si Action Platform. Uh, this is once again an initiative of uh, the Custody for Integral Human Development in particular, i.e. the Vatican, to gather momentum with answering um, or leaving Laudato Si in action. And so um, the, the Pope using the Castery for Integral Human Development has uh, uh, imagined and, and then uh, launched Laudato Si Action Platform. The Farm of Francesco together with many other uh, institutions and individuals is serving at um, the working group of Laudato Si Action Platform, trying to invite different constituencies to join the call effectively through joining the platform. Um, and so it's a seven year ecological convention journey uh, that is supported by a plan you develop within, within the action platform and resources that are available to you. It addresses seven sectors, like seven days of the week. Um, and everybody is invited to join it, no matter where you're from, what your religious conviction is, uh, and which sector you represent. Everyone is in, invited. And also there are seven goals of Laudato Si, um, all of which are interconnected, um, that the collective effort that the, the, the Vatican is trying to uh, encourage and support uh, is, are trying to, to work on. Um, and there are three objectives of Laudato Si Action Platform, um, facilitate ecological convention action, support bottom-up approaches, which is uh, once again, one of the core, value, core values of uh, the, the Parma Francesco and create a community. And I am happy to say, this is precisely what is happening uh, with our experience. And I'm sure Austin can talk to that or speak to that as well. I understand one of our call participants is uh, John from uh, Mount St. Mary University, which the Farm of Francesco just entered into a, a partnership with to advance on our work and, and our mission, who is celebrating birthday. So happy birthday to you, John, today. Uh, and that collaboration and engagement and counter collaboration would not be possible if not the platform. So a very real concrete example there. Um, and I'm talking about all of that because we are meeting, as Maria has mentioned at the beginning, during the Laudato Si week, which is yet another of the initiatives promoting Laudato Si thought, call, and rallying us um, with an invitation to answer that call, to answer this with, with action. And with that, I will simply say that all of you are invited either by supporting Farm of Francesco or Economy of Francesco or joining a Laudato Si action platform or uh, let's start small, which is reading Austin's book, which is here, and we have a Spanish version in Argentina. Um, so there are numerous um, ways in which you can um, be involved, and I know many of you are, like Caroline, who is one of our discussants. So over to you, Austin, or over to you, Maria, for uh, another um, for another next moment in this session. Thank you very much, uh, Mateus, for the introduction on uh, Laudato Si and how important is Laudato Si for, for us, for all of us that are here today. And uh, now I would like to introduce to Austin. Austin is a UK-based writer, journalist, and commenter best known for his book, as Mateus was uh, sh sharing, and I have here as well in Argentinian version. Among other books, uh, I will be uh, pasting his full bio in the chat but I will pass just the word to you, Austin. Uh, we are really looking forward to, to listening to you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Virginia and Mateusz, and hello, greetings to you all. Um, I am based in the UK, as Maria Virginia said, but I'm speaking to you, in fact, from Rome, where um, I've just come for a, for a week. And, um, and I, normally I'm in the UK and I'm on a small farm, and it is a very small farm, it's only 15 acres or six hectares. Uh, and um, we moved to the farm, my wife and I, uh, just at the end of 2019. Um, I suppose 
because we felt uh, that we wanted to do something in response to our democracy. And we fell in love with this house and discovered that it had the land as well. Um, and I'm just remembering to speak more slowly because I'm aware that uh, for not everybody, English is your first language. I just explain, I live on a small farm and I am learning how to apply Laudato Si. It is not a commercial farm. Uh, it is not making money, but it is helping to teach me a little bit about this question. Now, the, the, the topic today is what would a Laudato Si farm look like? Austin, and let me explain. One, one moment that I, um, we are not hearing you uh, super yeah. well. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I can do um, because I have this Wi-Fi. Um, I can try connecting to my phone. Hang on. Okay. While we while we wait for Austin, we do say one more time, happy birthday to John that is here with us. That is a very close partner of the of the Farmo Francesco. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Could you like speak without the the headphones, the AirPods? Because yeah, I, okay. I think he's reconnecting with us right now. Sorry. Okay, we we try one more time. Um, okay, I'm back connected to the Wi-Fi. Is it is it working? No. Okay. Sorry. No, I think like is. Are you able to speak without the AirPods? Oh uh, yeah, without the video. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Stop video. Okay, I'm now speaking without the video. Is that any better? It, it might be good so. to have the video on. Yeah. You want me to have the video on? Yeah, the video on, but can you speak without the low audiphonos? Like without the air. Oh, with, oh, without the airpods. Oh, sure. Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Because yeah. it might Hang be on. that, but it's not connecting super well. Okay. Okay, now now it might work, but I think that in your computer there is a still the setting of the AirPods. Like maybe you have to, because we are still like hearing you from the AirPods. Okay, I've just changed it to the built-in microphone. Is that any better? That now is perfect. Is that yeah. better? Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was, it was the AirPods. Okay, sorry. Right. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Gracias. Good. All right. <laughs> Um, right, so sorry about that. So I was just explaining that I live on a small farm and that I'm passionate about Laudato Si. And the, this, uh, the talk today is called, what would a Laudato Si farm look like? And I see this as the beginning of a discussion that I would like to have with you all. And a discussion that has begun between uh, Mateusz Maria, Maria Virginia and I uh, and also John, who's uh, on the call. Um, and the conversation, let me just explain what the conversation is. So we all know that the industrial farming model is one of the big culprits of, in, of the, the climate crisis. So we know that we need to move to another model of farming, which we will call regenerative farming. Uh, in other words, a farming that works with nature and that uh, is res restores the ecology uh, of the earth rather than uh, exploits it. We know we have to move to this new model and we know that the new model is emerging in many different ways across the world, small scale, regenerative, sustainable type farming. 
And then the question is what we, what the church can, what role the church can play in fermenting this and in contributing to it and in uh, adding to it. And it is my conviction from speaking to many people uh, on all sides of the church that everybody recognizes this and everybody says, we need to do this. We have many, many religious orders and institutions in the church, which have large amounts of land. The, la the church is a big land owner. And very often the land that is, belongs to schools and parishes and monasteries um, is not part of the mission of the institution. In other words, the land is either left or it is rented out or, but it doesn't form part of the mission of the institution. And it seems to me that since Laudato Si in 2015, the church has no choice but to embrace the mission of integral ecology and to turn this land over to a regenerative, into a regenerative model. In this way, helping to bring about the conversion that we need, but also helping to bring about the ecological conversion of the church. Now, I say this to people and they go, yes, <laughs> you're right. This is a great idea. But then the next question is, how does that happen? Now, because I've done a little bit of uh, exploration of the concept of regenerative agriculture, I've done, I did a course on it, for example. I know that there are many, many young people, and I say young because I'm too old for this, but people like Mateusz and Maria Virginia, who, have, who are in their 20s or 30s, who have a great, uh, obviously, uh, physical strength, but passion and also skills. Uh, and they very much want to move into this new model. And that is why Francesco Farm is a brilliant idea. But too often what they lack is land. And that is the one element, if we need the three elements for, a, for, a business, for a agriculture is land, labor, and capital, uh, then very often we have labor and it's skilled labor. I don't think there's a problem in a lack of capital either. I think the money exists to uh, ferment this kind of thing. Many religious orders would have, you know. The one thing that lack is lacking is land. And I think to, to, in order to persuade the church to offer up that land for regenerative agriculture, we need to offer a model of what a, a Laudato Si farm would look like. And then having, having uh, as it were, imagined that model, we can then begin to imagine what kind of scale this would be on and then do business plans and begin to think about a model. Now, of course, a, Fran a Laudato Si farm, a Francesco farm is gonna differ from country to country, climate to climate, situation to situation. But I think we can, if we together work on this, we can at least come up with a series of principles which would allow us to begin to do that. So I wanna begin this conversation today uh, at a very basic level. I will not be technical or complicated because I'm not very uh, uh, equipped to be so, um, but to set out what I see from my own reading of Laudato Si and Pope Francis's thinking, what a Laudato Si farm might look like. And I would begin, of course, with Laudato Si itself. And it is a document which, of course, is much, much bigger than a document about the environment. It's about how we live today. And it is about the relationship that we have with each other and with the created world. Uh, and this has been the great project of the Francis Pontificate has been to regenerate the bonds which tie us to, uh, to our oikos, to our environment in the deepest sense of the word. Just to pick out a few things in Laudato Si, Laudato Si talks about sustainable and diversified agriculture. It's very clear in Laudato Si that they see the need for this new model. Laudato Si does not explore what this farm would look like. It doesn't give examples, but it sets out a vision and certain principles which we can use to begin to think about what a farm would look like. Now, many of you know the document, and if you don't, you can easily look it up on the web, Laudato Si, it's available as a PDF. 
And what I will do is just mention a few things in it. And I will mention the paragraph numbers and you can look them up if you like to think about them more. Um, in paragraph 114, uh, Francis says, nobody is suggesting a return to the Stone Age. And I wanna begin here because this is not about trying to go back to a pre-technical or pre-mechanized notion of agriculture. Of course, we can be inspired by the past. And in many ways, medieval agriculture was regenerative in a way that today's isn't. But we also need technology. We have to live in the world that we are in now. So to continue that quote, nobody is suggesting a return to the Stone Age, but we need to slow down and look at reality in a different way to appropriate the positive and sustainable progress which has been made, but also to recover the values and the goals swept away by our unrestrained delusions of grandeur. So let's, let's be discerning about this. Let's take what's good in, in contemporary agriculture, all the advances technologically, but let's also be inspired by values which perhaps which have been lost in the model of industrial farming. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, actually, I'm not sure which paragraph this is, but it's, it's early on, I think it's paragraph nine. Uh, Pope Francis mentions St. Francis of Assisi and talks to, uh, says that uh, Francis asked, Francis of Assisi always asked that the friars uh, left part of the garden, the friary garden untouched so that wildflowers and herbs could grow there. And those who saw them could raise their minds to God, the creator of such beauty. So we have here the idea that when we have a farm or a garden in this case, it is a place of work, but it is also a place of contemplation. So that nature must, is not antithetical to agriculture, but the call is to integrate nature within agriculture so that we can contemplate and behold and learn from nature. Uh, in paragraph 34, Pope Francis talks about the extinction of species, which is a big drama at the moment in our environmental crisis. But he goes on to say that this is not just about the extinction of mammals and birds, uh, but also that good ecosystems require fungi, worms, and so on. Uh, and that uh, uh, it's very important to have, for example, birds uh, who are very, very important, bees important for pollination. In other words, uh, we need to have, I would say it's clear, biodiversity, as much difference, as much diversity of the natural world as is possible to have. And there's a clear implication there about the need to build the soil. Uh, paragraph 164 is a very famous paragraph talking about the need for a common plan for the world uh, to take us through this environmental crisis, to, to accept that we are one humanity living in a shared common home. And I only mention this because he talks there about the need for a consensus to plan a sustainable and diversified agriculture. So that's the expression that's used in Laudato Si, sustainable and diversified agriculture. Uh, and he goes on to say, talk about renewable and less polluting forms of energy, a better, a better use of better management of forest resources, ensuring access to water and so on. But I mentioned that paragraph because of that phrase, sustainable and diversified agriculture. In paragraph 180, he talks about uh, uh, um, improving agriculture, especially in poor regions, um, through development of techniques of sustainable agriculture. Okay, so there again, we have the word sustainable. New forms of cooperation and community organization can be encouraged, he says, in order to defend the interests of small producers and to preserve local ecosystems from destruction. Paragraph 180, I want to suggest, is a key paragraph because it talks about sustainable agriculture and then immediately links it to forms of community organization and cooperation, which is what small producers need to get together in order to defend their interests against the power of uh, the supermarkets and the big producers. So we have immediately here the implication 
that a Laudato Si farm is part of a network, as Francesco Farm has created, of producers who can support each other. Okay. In paragraph 88, um, it simply says that the bishops of Brazil have pointed out that nature as a whole not only manifests God, but is a locus of his presence. And I do think this is important that farming that cooperates with nature is a farm which understands that nature is a locus of God's presence. There is an imminent presence of God in nature. Now, how that is so is, of course, in a way, hard to articulate. Uh, and it's a, it's a great topic, by the way, um, uh, uh, which I think is opening up increasingly in theology. But just to point out that that principle is there, that if, God, that if nature is the locus of, of God's presence, then that necessarily uh, affects how we respond uh, to it. In 140, each organism as a creature of God is good and admirable in itself. So we start from the presupposition that we do not seek to eradicate organisms and species from our farms. Of course, we don't want all the slugs to eat all our lettuces. We need to control, uh, we need to control and, and, and make sure things don't dominate. Uh, but we start from the presupposition that basically even nasty things like, you know, wasps and so on, they all have their place, uh, even if they might threaten us. Uh, they have their place and we should give them their place. And then vitally at the end of that paragraph 140, he uses the word regenerative. And I want to pick up on this. He says, so when we speak of sustainable use, consideration must always be given to each ecosystem's regenerative ability in its different areas and aspects. And I want to suggest that more than sustainable, this is the key term for us, is regenerative. Because each ecosystem must have the capacity to regenerate itself. In other words, if our farming depletes, exhausts, and reduces the ecosystem, then it's bad. If our farming uh, restores, regenerates, and allows the ecosystem to regenerate, then it's good or improve. Okay. So, and then the last thing I just want to mention is the question of ecological conversion, which forms, of course, a very important part of the encyclical in the last part, where it's talking about a spirituality that arises uh, from, uh, from all of this. Uh, and that here we have uh, uh, the rich, uh, an ecological spirituality grounded in the convictions of our faith. And then Francis says, more than in, in, in ideas or concepts as such, I'm interested in how such a spirituality can motivate us to a more passionate concern for the protection of our world. In other words, anything we do in this respect, we understand that it will help to in, develop uh, this spirituality, this understanding of us in relation to, uh, in relation to creation in the context of agriculture. Now, I'll, I'll now, having just mentioned a few of those paragraphs, and as you see, you know, farming is not a subject, a great topic. It's mentioned a lot, agriculture is mentioned, but it's mentioned always in context of what needs to change. But we have the core of, 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 of a vision contained there in Laudato Si. So I would suggest that the first and major principle of a Laudato Si farm is that it is what I call regenerative plus. And what I mean by regenerative is, and, 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 and there's a lot you know, discussed and written about this, and I'll wanna keep it simple. But the difference between sustainable and regenerative is that sustainable understands that uh, you know, we need to maintain this in the long term, uh, that it should be, uh, that we shouldn't be depleting. But regenerative goes a bit further. Regenerative says, no, we should be actively seeking to build up what we have. And this is a reflection of the shift in the thinking of many people in recognition that now in agriculture, soil and the environment has been so depleted uh, that we have to, that, are, that we can't simply sustain what we've got. We have to be actively regenerating uh, what we have inherited. Now, there are a lot of implications for, of this. Uh, and, um, uh, but just to mention that the term regenerative is a term that I think is now becoming increasingly common. Now I've posted in the in the uh, in the chat. Uh, it's too big 
to put in there. It's a PDF file of stories of people who have created in Europe regenerative farms on a small scale. This is nothing to do with Laudato Si. These are young people saying, we want to work with nature, we want to do this, and we want profitable companies, businesses, farms. So their stories, lots and lots of different stories, which I think will inspire you about how uh, these uh, businesses uh, uh, and farms have been created. And they all focus on this question of how we can be more and more regenerative. And it's something that we learn to do. It's something I've been learning on my little farm. You know, I, I do things and then I realize, no, there's a more regenerative way of doing that, you know? Uh, but it's things like this. It's about caring for and building up the soil. The soil is the most important thing you can have on the farm. It, a good soil is dark and moist and full of life. Uh, and if you have good soil, you don't need fertilizers. You don't need to feed plants. You need to look after your soil. And you do that by mulching as, as nature does, by putting a layer each year at least on top of the soil of decaying matter which regenerates the soil. So compost making is a huge part of any Laudato Si farm, making lots and lots of compost. Regenerative grazing strategies, a lot to be said about this, have animals. You must have animals on a Laudato Si farm. They're essential because uh, of what comes out of their back end apart from anything else. Uh, you know, we need their waste product. Uh, but regenerative grazing is about allowing the ground to recover after it's been grazed. And then, you know, so you move your livestock around. Um, policies on your farm to encourage pollinators, so that's having bees. Uh, it's about having ponds. It's about encouraging birds. And it's about having wild areas of the sort that I mentioned earlier, fields given over to wildflowers. The key thing here is biodiversity. The more we know about this is the link between regenerative agriculture and biodiversity is clear. The more diverse your farm is, uh, then the more regenerative it will be. And that's one of the things that we have lost with industrial farming. Now, another question, another thing that a regenerative farm uh, does is endlessly plant trees and hedges, which is what we've been doing on our few acres. Every year, plant, plant, plant. They say uh, where I live in, in England, that the best time to plant a tree is 50 years ago and the next best time is now. Plant, 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 because our land has become so denuded of perennials that it has lost its capacity for regeneration. So plant trees and plant hedges and in, and in, in so far as possible create therefore good environments for wildlife. The use of water, harvesting rainwater, Understanding how water flows through our land using contours to make use of water, the best possible use of water. In general, this is about learning to work with rather than against nature, to understand more and more how nature supports agriculture, that nature is not our enemy. I won't say more than that because it's a whole complex area, but regenerative is the key word. And I say regenerative plus, because I think what we need in an Laudato Si farm is all those principles which are well developed out there. But the plus comes in our own reflection on it and our own capacity um, to develop the regenerative element by constantly reflecting in the light of the gospel and Laudato Si on what we are doing. But a couple of other features which seem to me obvious. I've mentioned diversity. A, a, a Laudato Si farm needs to be diverse for lots of reasons, not least because that's more regenerative. So vegetables, livestock, grains, poultry, it's important to have that mix. The third question is really a very difficult question. I'm sure you will all have opinions on this, is about scale. And I think scale is an interesting question because there are good regenerative farms in, which are huge. You know, uh, In other words, you can have a very big farm which is regenerative, I accept that. But in general, the best examples are fairly small scale. They are quite intensive, labor intensive. Um, there's a human scale to this kind of farming. And again, it's not about avoiding machinery. This is not against technology but it's a discerning use of, te of technology. If all your farming depends all the time on big tractors, you cannot have a Laudato Si farm. 
because the trees will be in the way. You know, the whole way you operate your farm will be, will be antithetical to the regenerative principle. But of course, tractors are necessary, you know, but, but again, fossil fuels, the use of those, all that has to be discerned. But just to say, I think the question of scale and technology is an issue which every Laudato Si farm needs to face and needs to discern. And getting that right balance, I think, is important. Um, and then I would say also uh, the connection with the community is vital. A Laudato Si farm must be connected to the local community, have an open gate policy, as they call it in the regenerative world, so that people are coming to the farm to buy their food uh, and they see how the animals are treated and they see the example. So this is the witness element. A Laudato Si farm must be a witness and it can only be a witness when it is connected to the community. Uh, uh, um, and that implies vegetable box schemes and other kinds of schemes which allow local people to engage with and benefit from organic uh, vegetables, uh, good organic vegetables, and, and to engage them in the process. Because part of the problem is that people uh, increasingly do not have no connection with the world of agriculture and farming. And most industrial farms are completely inaccessible to the general public. They, you would not want to go in there. <laughs> Whereas a, a Laudato Si farm needs to be inviting, it needs to be accessible uh, a, a, and therefore linked to uh, the community. Uh, and then uh, finally, I would just say uh, that the, the, there's a vital part of a Laudato Si farm, which is clearly missionary. It exists as it were, as a mission to the world. Of course, it, it needs to be profitable, it needs to make money, but that is part of the sustainability of the enterprise. Uh, uh, we need to think about sustainable businesses, but that they are essentially missionary in that they exist to, to show another kind of a way of being. And that means that necessarily a Laudato Si farm will be subject to scrutiny. People will look at it and want to know how it works. So I think this missionary dimension of a Laudato Si farm is very important. Be clear about your values. What kind of a work ethic exists? How are decisions made on the farm? Farming is always hard work. It's very hard work with long hours, always. And that's good because work is good. And so but how do we understand work? as cooperation with the creator, rather than a work ethic, which is all about being driven. What spaces do we give for contemplation? What spaces do we give uh, for reflecting on what we do in the light of the values that we uh, stand for? So this part, last aspect, I think um, uh, is, is very, very interesting. And I just wanna mention here, uh, I don't know whether he's with us, but is, is Father Manuel Katongole here? No. Okay. Well, I just want to mention that uh, th there is a, some great examples out there, uh, and there's one in Uganda, uh, and it's called the Bethany Land Institute. I'll put the link. And they, they have thought about this, and they have produced some values, and it's very inspiring. Um, so I think this conversation, which hopefully is beginning here, you know, we can bring in partners to this conversation, people who are already doing this in different ways. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have some examples, uh, but this is really just a way of beginning that conversation. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to do that with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Austin. And, and I love what you shared because you mentioned uh, regeneration, you mentioned um, like, making these based in stories of people and in specific examples and not just like on only like saying something that is purely like theoretical, but also like that we can learn from others. Um, I also love what you said about like common plan for the world because like this, we cannot do it by, our, by ourselves. We have to do it in a common way, in a common answer that is discerned. And that is very much what we, what we want to do in the places like this today and, and this week in particular. Like we want to co-create with others and, and we believe on doing this only if we do it in a common way and together. 
and with the local communities and, and learning from those that are witnesses and also like hoping to be witnesses as well or like for other people. So thank you very much for everything you share. I did share the link of uh, the Bethany Land Institute in the chat and we are already getting questions. Uh, but before opening the, the Q&A, we have our discussions here today. And I would love to start with uh, Salvador, Salvador Padilla. Uh, he is from Mexico. He's a young economy. And very recently he started a project in uh, Mariapolis El Diamante in Mexico. Mariapolis that is part from uh, Economy of Communion. And he is uh, building an ecological conversion with the farmers there that were already uh, farming in the region and is currently studying economy and territorial development. And last but not least, super important, like we know uh, Salvador through the economy of Francesco and we are exploring to build one of our farm of Francesco farms in the region of El Diamante in the, in La, in the Mariapolis. So we are like working in this process together. So uh, Salvador, the word is yours. Thank you, Maria Virginia. I'm very grateful for being here with all of you and with Austin too. I think that the Christians uh, cannot remain indifferent in relation with all of the social ecological problems. It's our responsibility to contribute to this positive transformation of the temporal realities, the economics, the politics, education, culture, and whole society. And we have the inspiration in the life and the teachings of Jesus and the church tradition, in particular with the Pope Francis. Uh, he has given much emphasis to these issues and he wants to, to go out to the peripheries, not only in the center of the power, but, uh, uh, but uh, work with the poor and for the poor. Austin, uh, first I want to ask you um, uh, a question about the agro sector. I identified two great sectors, the peasants and the agro industry business. And there are a lot of particularities, but we can identify some general patterns. First, in the peasants have a small extension of land. The production is more for subsistence. Uh, difference, the agro-industry businessmen have large extension of land and the production is more focused on the market. Uh, we can find similarities because both sectors uh, are more increasingly dependent on external inputs, synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, and remain the precarious labor relations and suffer serious environmental degradation in their territories. In your opinion, how uh, we can combine or catalyze the shift to more ecological and more regenerative farming? What do you think about it? Thanks, Salvador. That's a great question. When you talked about peasants, you kind of met, you were really thinking of campesinos, no, in the in the Mexican context, and the landowners would be the the hacendados, no, uh, or latifund hacendados, no. <laughs> exactly. uh, oh, it, what in or in Argentina would be called estancieros. So the the, the big ranches, you know, and and Latin America has these very dramatic difference between these two kind of models. Um, in in England, we also have increasingly bigger and bigger farms. So the drama of the last 40, 50 years in England and in Europe is small farms, often family run, have been closing uh, and uh, because of economies of scale and because effectively of the supermarkets. You know, the supermarkets have this incredible purchasing power. Uh, and so the small farmers just simply can't compete. Now, I think that, so the, the, the big question I mean, my neighbor in England, who is a big farmer, well, 300 acres, and he's a big potato and wheat farmer. And he says to me, look, we've been told to grow cheap food, you know, at, in very large quantities. And the world is not yet ready to pay more for its food. And, I, you know, I think he's right. So I think, you know, we are having a shock at the moment because of the prices as a result of the Ukraine war. Um, and I think food is gonna become more expensive and there are gonna be shortages and so on. I think all this is inevitable. 
the industrial agriculture model will last, there's no question. To me, the question is, how do we develop alongside that another model, which is attractive and profitable, uh, but which does not try to compete at that level, uh, which is much more community based. So I suppose it's something in between your two models of the rancho and the hacienda, you know, it's somewhere in between. Uh, and I wonder, you will know in Latin America whether that is how feasible that is. But I think that's where I see the movement in the future will be the development of the small to medium scale farm, diversified, focused on the community, local community, uh, with obviously some high, possibly high quality production, uh, but which tries to find a path through those two models. Yes, as, as an economist, I think that this economic argument uh, that's powerful because uh, more ecological agriculture uh, are less dependent for external inputs and the peasants can uh, make his own fertilizer, for example, with lumber compost, for example, you know? and, and other techniques uh, sometimes uh, more easy, but this knowledge uh, has lost in the recent decades because the green revolution. Right. I think that the, the economic the economic arguments are very important, but I think that is in, insufficient. Uh, we need to reach something deeper, increase our consciousness of our relation with all of beings. Yeah. Uh, right. How do you think these uh, socio-ecological challenges mm. uh, can be addressed in, in schools as communities, for example? Because I mean, I, I, would, I would just say from an economic point of view, you shouldn't underestimate the extent to which the current farming model is in crisis. You know, I, the farmers around me, because fuel has just gone massively increased at the moment, uh, the cost of fertilizer, massive increases. And the farmers around me are saying, we're not going to plant <laughs> this year. You know, we're, we're going to reduce our production, which is crazy because prices are rising. But they're saying we can't afford to take the risk because the huge investments that are involved with that model. Um, in, other words, in other words, I suspect that as we have a more unstable world economy, I think the big industrial farming model is going to be more and more in crisis. That's all I'm saying. Don't underestimate that element, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um. uh, finally, uh, I saw that you know about the Mariapolis, the movement for color. Uh, I'm here in the Mariapolis El Diamante, near of the city of Puebla. If you want to visit us, you are very bad. <laughs> we are constructing. I love Puebla. I love Puebla. I, ah, I love Puebla. fantastic. <laughs> We are co-starting a community process of ecological conversion in line with Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti too. What are the recommendations do you give us, to us? Uh, because I think that uh, it's not only the farm of Francesco or Laudato Si uh, farm, uh, but uh, we can think something like a Laudato Si village, the Mariapolis, like a Laudato Si village. What do you think about it? I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm a great admirer of the Mariopolis and the economy of communion. Um, and I think uh, to the extent that you integrate ecological principles into your broader vision of an economy of communion, I think that's really powerful. Uh, very, very powerful. Uh, I think the links, increasingly the church, I think is beginning to make links between this ecological framework and a church which is more synodal and more fraternal. And uh, this is what becomes, I think, increasingly the witness of the church in the contemporary world. And you know, if you can have a place which you can actually visit, where you can se puede palpar, no? you can actually feel the, that this is going on, I think that becomes a very great witness in our, in our world. So I would, I, would, I would love to hear more about it. Okay. Thank you very much, much uh, Salvador. And, and I hope to visit uh, the Mariapolis too one day. Um, 
So now, like, uh, let me introduce our second discussant. Uh, she is uh, Caroline. Uh, it's a pleasure to finally meet you because we have exchanged some emails. Uh, she uh, has done uh, several advisory roles in law, energy, and finance, and she's the founder of Vivas, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, that has the goal of supporting the social and solidarity economy. She is currently advising and investing in regenerative projects in the area of agriculture, food system, education, arts, inclusion, and media. Thank you very much, and the word is yours, Caroline. Thank you, Maria. Thank you to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose I've I wrote down some notes during the during the the, the different discussions, and the one of the the things that kept coming to mind was the concept of land as mother, and you know how do you how do you pay tribute to your mother? Um, and I really like this concept of you know regenerative plus, um, and I suppose one of the things that I'm interested in is. How do you create, you know, how do you create a place that's welcoming and a place that is conducive to transmission of values? Um, and I think that having spent time in nature in the U.S., I spent time uh, near Woodstock, New York, as a child, where you know, uh, having spent time in land and you know the things that that sort of strike me are you need to have presence of family, you need to have presence of nature. And for me, what was really, you know, important during my childhood was the presence of music. Um, and, you know, how do you create a farm that's not only regenerative from an economic, from an environmental, from an agricultural perspective, but it's also regenerative in terms of cultural capital and human capital. Um, and I think, you know, having having seen, you know, this, this, this concept of land as mother and a place of transmission, you know, what place do we have for transmission of, of art, of culture, of heritage, of um, sort of, you know, collective values and sense of honoring our ancestors? Um, so perhaps I'll pause there. Wow, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and um, this is why I keep thinking, and this is just an intuition, but you know, I can see in my mind, a monastery or a convent which has declining numbers you know and they want to somehow pass on that legacy by the way i've just been today in rome with the religious what's called the union of religious superiors here representing i don't know 800,000 religious worldwide so it's a, it's a, it's fast i've had some fascinating conversations and they have actually a project within the us which is how to manage the handover of these institutions and their properties. And the big question is how do we continue the charism of our foundations, but no longer with, you know, with the vocations that we used to have? And it just seems to me what you're articulating there is a vision of um, a religious community. In other words, a community inspired by uh, Christian values, which puts great emphasis on family, a healthy, good environment for families to, to be raised in, which also puts a big emphasis on, you know, reading and on culture. And I just say the image in my mind is that there's this, there's this small body of aging nuns and around them, you know, are these farms or a big farm, maybe, who knows, in which people can be doing this. Uh, that's the image in my mind. I don't know whether that's helpful. Do you see that, you know, why it's why I want to start this conversation? Because I think what they need, what the, what the orders need is, you know, people like you to go to them and say, I have a dream. You know, I have a dream. This is, this is my dream. But I need a place. I need the land. And I need the support also of, you know, of you and your tradition uh, and your stability. Now, one of the questions that I, I ask is, who owns this farm? How is it owned? How do you, because many religious orders I've spoken to say, okay, fine, we give over our land to this, but what guaranteed that they won't be gone in a year's time, you know? So that question of stability, because religious orders, of course, they take vows, you know, how do we manage that in a Laudato Si farm? How, how do people express their commitment? I think those are difficult questions, but I think what you're outlining implies a degree of stability and commitment over time. And I wonder what that looks like in a lay situation on a, on a Francesco farm. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you, Austin, and thank you, Caroline. Um, 
Now I will give the word to our third discussant before we go into the open Q&A. Um, she is uh, Jenny Natalie Julio. She is from Colombia and she was and is part of the farm of Francesco since it was born, actually like before it was born. Um, we met and we went into all the process together. She uh, is a historian and she is focused in pedagogy in particular a focus on the work with victims of conflicts and rural population in Colombia. Natalie? And Natalie is going to speak in English or maybe Spanish. If she is in Spanish, I will be doing the, the translation. Gracias, Virginia. Uh, voy a hablar en español porque en inglés es desastroso. Um, mi pregunta va en el mismo sentido que la pregunta de Salvador. La experiencia eh, del modelo agrícola impuesto en Latinoamérica desde el periodo colonial, no sé cuándo parió Virginia, eh, sí. ha llevado a, a que simplemente el monocultivo, principalmente para la provisión de materias primas y productos agrícolas al norte global, que es Europa y Norteamérica. Okay, so uh, Natalie is speaking in Spanish. Uh, I know Austin understands, but I'm like translated for our audience today. Um, she is like concerning and, and like focusing in the work of the indigenous people and uh, peasants. And her question is related with the question from Salvador on how, um, because like in the places the, the production was done mainly in monoculture. Natalie. Ok. Um, y de acuerdo a lo que se está hablando en el conversatorio sobre tratar de impulsar la agricultura regenerativa desde, desde lo comunitario. So, like, it was discussed about how we can uh, create the regenerative model uh, in a community level today in the discussion. Digamos que plantea una, o bueno, más bien, en América Latina tenemos varias experiencias relativas a, a un modelo de resistencia, o más bien, a resistir al modelo del monocultivo desde la época colonial. So in Latin America we have a movement that is uh, resilient or resistance to the monoculture since the colonial times. Okay. Sin embargo, el hecho de que existan pactos macroeconómicos como los tratados de libre comercio. But considering that there are like um, global pacts of fair trade, pacts in a global level. Eh, que siempre nos dejan en esa posición de subordinación en la producción de materias primas y agrícolas para el norte global, impide que podamos desarrollar o que esas eh, formas de resistencia comunitarias puedan ascender o volverse más fuerte. That force us to, to live and have um, a model that is subordinate, if that is the right English word, to uh, the global north model. Lo que ha reincidido en la descampesinización, no sé cómo lo vas a decir en inglés. Sí, me la está haciendo complicada. <laughs> that led to, um, reduce the presence of peasants e indígenas en nuestra región and indigenous people in our region la pregunta es cómo eh, las personas como ustedes que desde el norte global están trabajando en la agricultura regenerativa pueden ayudarnos a nosotros y a nosotras en América Latina para fortalecer los procesos de resistencia a campesinos e indígenas que también caminamos hacia la agricultura regenerativa. So how do you that are working in the global north can support us in the global south to um, support the indigenous communities and the resistance that they have in working in, in several ways that are forced from the global north uh, in a way that we can live in the global south um, regenerative agriculture and put that into practice. Wow, so um, a small question. <laughs> um, 
so you, the, the first part of the question is about the dependence of Latin American countries on, uh, on, on single uh, exports of agricultural products, which in turn, uh, of course, conditions that macro industrial farming model at the expense of small scale cultivation. So the question is how you can build up the relative power and strength of the small scale uh, cultivator uh, ag ag farmers. And um, as I guess the question is that the strength of that sector must come necessarily uh, from its own capacity to generate um, a diverse range of products which have a demand. And you know the experience I think of here of regenerative agriculture on a fairly small scale is that the products are bought by people who value increasingly value uh, organic food because they want to know where it's come from and they want to know how it's produced because people are increasingly aware that the 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 food that we buy which has been grown in in you know bananas in colombia which have been transported across the world in refrigerated ships you know by the time they're on the supermarket shelf have a very low nutritional value and they don't taste very good and that's true of most of the products in supermarkets that are imported. And I think people increasingly are saying, you know, we need our tomatoes to taste great. Now, for that, they need to pay more and they do pay more, you know. So there is an increasingly a market of people who appreciate the value of good food. Uh, and I think that's the answer to your question, that in, for, an, for export as well, I think, you know, products which are really well produced, uh, and organic, you can charge a higher price for them. It'll be a much smaller scale production, but if it's profitable, it helps to build the sector, you know? Uh, and I think, uh, just to repeat what I said earlier, I think in part, what I would say is, we can't resolve the macroeconomic questions. We can't change the big models of production and export overnight. They're not gonna change overnight. But what we can do is build up that the strength of that sector. And the last part of your question is how regenerative agriculture in the north can help. Well, I think you're talking about networks of solidarity and you're talking about networks of exchange of ideas. You're talking about uh, um, uh, a more networked. And that's what Laudato Si was saying when you know, we need to network and the church can help to bring together small scale farmers in such a way that together they represent a substantial and quite powerful body. And I said that's about community organization. And I think that's what the church in Latin America does really well. Uh, and so I can imagine that the Farmer Francesco network and similar networks become in the future an important vehicle for sharing transmission and solidarity between our continents. Thank you, Natalie. Quiero agregar una sola cosa no? para ir un poco más allá. Um, yo tengo la sensación de que en espacios como este podríamos también plantear de la misma forma solidaria en la que la, lo plantea nuestro oponente, generar eh, relaciones comerciales entre cooperativas de consumidores en Europa y cooperativas de productores en América Latina. Es algo que, que creo que se puede hacer y que um, les invito a que también piensen desde sus lugares y sus trabajos y sus, eh, sí, sus roles. Sí. Y, y ya se está haciendo, sorry, we're, I mean, it's already being done with the what's called the trade craft networks here, so, you know, the churches often get together and buy products which they know have been fairly, are paying a just price in Africa or in Latin America. And these same networks can be expanded, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalie was inviting all of us to think from our places, from our works, how we can keep uh, connecting and building bridges from the global south and the global north when it comes to um, cooperatives or when it comes to work together like what is being produced in um, the global south to be commercialized in the global north and, um, and yeah. 
So thank you very much, Natalie. I was going to say again, like the answer from Austin, like, and this is being done, like, and we think that the, the spaces that here that we have, and these that, that Austin was bringing, this common plan, this common conversation, these building bridges is what we, what we are doing. So thank you very much, Natalie, for inviting us to keep believing on that and keep doing that from the places that we are. Austin, uh, I have, we have uh, Emmanuel joining us. So I will ask him to join us as a panelist. And in the meantime, we invite all of you. We already have a lot of questions. So after uh, Emmanuel sharing for some minutes, we will be opening the q and I'm really glad that uh, Father Emmanuel is joining us, not least because he can answer these questions that have been building up. Uh, but just to, to say very uh, quickly before, I have not met Father Emmanuel before, but we have been put in touch by, uh, by a mutual friend. And as I've already mentioned to you, the Bethany Land Institute is a very important player in this. And as Father Emmanuel will tell you, uh, um, he is, I believe, not Ugandan, but anyway, his, his operation is in Uganda. And the diocese there has handed over to his project 400 acres, uh, I think, 600, 400 acres, uh, on which they are putting into practice uh, the principles of Laudato Si. Father Emmanuel, great to see you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we've been, I've, thank I've you very begun, much. I began, I began by talking about some principles of what a Laudato Si farm could look like. Tell us what your Laudato Si farm already looks like. Thank, thank you very much, Austin. And uh, thank you, uh, Virginia and uh, uh, Matthias for inviting me. I'm sorry, I had a meeting. I could not ex get, get out of the meeting to and join you at the beginning, but I'm so happy to be uh, with you. I am in Uganda now. The internet connection is not very good, but I am Father Emmanuel Katongole. I'm a priest of Kampala Archdiocese in Uganda. So this is my native uh, home, uh, but I teach at the University of Notre Dame. In South Bend. Father Emmanuel, maybe we can try to improve the connection to have your uh, camera um, off. In 2003, of us priests decided we wanted to be. Okay. Let me see if I can turn my camera off. Uh oh. Is, is that working better? Yes. Let's try. Is that working better, I think? I think, I think it is. Carry on. Carry on. Okay. So in response to Pope Francis's invitation, three priests came together and we wanted to be an education uh, program that Pope Francis was calling for to cultivate and nurture the spirituality and the practice and the vision of integral ecology, working with young people in the rural community where over 65% of the population live. And there they live on and off the land. One way we said we need to do that is to encourage sustainable agriculture, which is really about uh, caring for the soil and the land. And uh, in a way, responding to Genesis chapter two, verse 15, if you care for the land, the land will care 
for you. So it's grounded within this biblical vision of caring for the land. And so we call our young people caretakers. They spend two years at Bethany Land Institute uh, engaged in this practice of caretaking. Uh, but also we know that taking care of the soil of the land is connected to the environment. So there is a big ecological dimension to our work and at the same time an ecological, uh, an economic dimension. We talk about three E's, education, ecology, and economics, and how they can need to go together. That's the kind of the integral ecology. We use the stories from Bethany to provide us with a kind of spirituality and glue to this program. Because Bethany in the New Testament was the place where the poor lived. That's why the name Bethany. And, but that's where Jesus always stayed with the poor. And so we wanted to use that story to show that God lives among the poor. And when God lives among the poor, great things happen. And so we use the story, for example, of Mary, the sister of Martha, who was always at the feet of Jesus, listening, learning, and becoming intimate. And so that is the education program for sustainable learning to listen to the soil, but at the same time learning to listen to one self and to God and to one another, the whole community dimension. So under this program, we teach skills of sustainable agriculture, but basically grounded in the, pro, in the, in the conviction that we don't need to fight nature but to attend, to be attentive to nature and follow nature's pattern. And that way, in a way, nature yields all, all this kind of abundance. So we do sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture. We call all that skills of listening to the soil. But in the process, there is a whole form for the spirituality of the caretaker, the inner connection, but also the connection with God. God. So our farming education program is not just the skills, it's, it's the spirituality of listening. listening. Secondly, Azarus forest died, but was brought back to life. The ecology is sick, is dying. How do we resurrect the ecology? And we do it through reforestation, forest conservation, and wetland conservation. So this is the ecological dimension of our program. We have a forest over uh, 200 acres that we are leased to BLI by the diocese, the natural forest. So we do use the ecological dimension. Our goal, a million trees by the year 2050 at Bethany Land Institute and throughout the community. So we use that as the education program. We call that Lazarus. We use these images and names because they stick uh, to people, uh, but also they kind of draw us deeper into the biblical spirituality. The third program is what we call Martha's Market. Jesus came to a village called Bethany and a woman welcomed him to her house. So who is this woman who had her own house? The whole economics is about household management. So Martha is the model for that kind of household management, self-sustaining, she had her own house and you could see uh, that she was a leader in her community. So this is the whole economic dimension. Part of the land we use as demonstration 
of how this sustainable regenerative agriculture works. And part of the land we use as commercial to grow our food, our fruits, and cash crops for the money generating part of the program. But also the caretakers, each one is given a plot of land where they experiment and whatever they grow, they sell and put some money aside. As part of the program, there is also a microfinance credit as part of the Mathers market that is run by the caretakers themselves. So there is Mary's farm, Lazarus trees and Mathers market. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel, for sharing uh, also from but your They experience. all work together. It helps us create that kind of integral uh, ecology and integral dimension of our, of, 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 our, of our program. So two years in the program. Then when the students graduate, they go home. Um, farms of regenerative agriculture and then they become teachers. In the community, as part of the commitment, each one farmers in the community. There's a lot of community outreach with the schools and with the community around. That way we think that through this program, we can form Yeah, I'm for these leaders, caretakers, in a way, make our villages flourish uh, of the rural communities through so regenerative. Thank you, Emmanuel. I think the connection is not uh, helping today, but we want to have this so moment. That's, that, that, that's basically the program. Yeah. Okay, we want to have some moments for the Q and A's as well as we have many coming from, from those that are joining us today. So uh, we will have this moment of this less than 15 minutes for that. First question we had from, um, from Carolina. Carolina, would you like to uh, open your microphone and ask your question? Carolina Alzate. Mm, qué pena, es que acá me entró como una llamada. Caro, we can hear you. Okay, no. Carol. Okay, we have from Carolina and we also have one question from Peter. So, yeah, if one of you is ready for the, for the question, please feel free to, to ask me. Okay, Carol is telling us that she cannot, uh, but I can read her question. So uh, Carolina was asking us, Dear Austin, for what you are mentioning about biodiversity and regeneration, have you met agroforestry in the North? I only know them in the South, Latin America. Do you think it's possible, is a possible technique in other places? Um, I believe that agroforestry uh, is increasingly being used in Europe as well. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but for those who are unfamiliar with the concept as I understand it, it is, it is gr essentially growing crops uh, between rows of trees so that you're bringing uh, together these two concepts, agriculture and forestry uh, together. And there are some great examples of it, um, but I suspect Father Emmanuel will, will know it much more because he has a forest there in Uganda. So I will pass the question to Father Emmanuel. Uh, so the, the question from uh, Caro, do you think that agroforestry can be done in the, in the global north? Do you know any cases? 
in the global north. Uh, no, I'm not very much familiar with the uh, agroforestry in the global north. Uh, but I know in the global south, that is definitely the way to go. A part of, uh, I think the reason is that the global south has not been fully hooked onto the technocratic farming paradigm of the conventional agriculture. And so we still have room to experiment and kind of encourage agroforestry. In the north, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm eager, I want to see and here are some experiments uh, of what is going on in the global north in terms of agroforestry. Okay, uh, thank you, Father Emmanuel. We have a question also from Alejandro Trainer. Alejandro, would you like your to ask your question live? It takes some time until like the microphones are being on. Okay, I can, I don't know if you can like uh, open your audio, but like I can start like reading the question. So uh, Alejandro is telling us, is uh, mentioning that you often have spoken about times of farm of, like different types of farm of Francesco. There are examples of how it should be which is like diverse with animals, perennials, with the smaller machines, and fundamentally with more human involvement. And he loves the concept. And while we promote this concept so that more and more people create these kind of farms, we also must deal with how food is produced for the urban masses, much more than half of the world's population. Should we now open up the principles of the farm of Francesco and Laudato Si farms to uh, large farms? So that these can also traditionally, uh, sorry, so these can also transition gradually. Otherwise, we create a them and us, while this might not be necessary. This could help us have much more impact. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I don't think anybody would want to exclude anybody from undertaking farming on the large scale farmer wanted to implement these principles. I, that's wonderful. Uh, so this isn't uh, an us and them. Uh, but I just think that in practice, in reality, um, the current model of industrial farming has required such a huge investment of capital in very, very large machinery um, that the whole model depends on it. So you have my neighbor has hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of machinery and you know, fertilizers and everything. And the whole model is predicated on that. And I just think that um, for them to transition to a different kind of farming is very, very difficult. And probably what is more likely to happen is that that big scale model will more and more enter into crisis, as, I, as I've been saying. The economics of it will become harder and harder. And then I think alongside it, we will get the, the growth of these smaller scale farms. And I think there will begin then to be a kind of crossover between the two. I think that's probably how it will work. Uh, but that's why I stress the importance of uh, the example. And, you know, Father Emmanuel has added something very important to the list of principles, which is the importance of teaching. We must teach these skills to the next generation, uh, because people, at least in Europe, increasingly don't have the skills. Because people, farms employ very few people. You know, in the United Kingdom, fewer than 1% of the working population is employed in agriculture. It's an amazing figure. Uh, uh, everything's done, machine, robots. Uh, it requires very few people. And uh, so, yeah, I think, I think it's going to enter into crisis. Thank you, Austin. And also to, to Alejandro, as a reminder, if he wants to um, open his microphone, uh, he can, he's allowed to do so. So when you, 
Okay. No, I'm I'm very sorry. I was I had to take a, an urgent call earlier. That's why I had to be absent. But I have heard um, what you were just saying now, Austin, and uh, I I I agree with you. I am involved in agriculture, and I I'm working with um, large scale farmers across Belgium, UK, and and, and France, and, and some other countries, um, with with an intention of enabling them to trend, to adopt uh, regenerative practices. Um, I agree with you that the model is in crisis. I think many, many farmers agree with you. Um, and the, but the thing is, <clears throat> you know, there is a world, there is a, a scenario where that crisis happens, they stop producing food, other people are not fast enough in catching up, and then we have a massive food crisis. So we need to somehow guide that transition. I believe that it's possible to bring them on in the journey and to make adaptations. Um, I, I, the, there are many models that will have to disappear. Um, but um, yes, I, 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 I remain um, fearful of this us and them idea because the, the ideal model of the Farmer Francesco uh, depends on, on people actually making the personal decision of going to the land. Um, if that happens too slowly, um, then we have a massive crisis in our hands. <laughs> so I think that it's it's possible to to assist the transition of the big um, farms um, in adopting regenerative practices and improving their practices as as they go. Yeah, no, I think I think that's wonderful, and and I can see from your profile that that you're involved in the in kind of investments that will facilitate that, and that's wonderful. Uh, I, I, I'm completely in favour. I suppose really what this discussion is about is specifically about how uh, young people who are passionate uh, of, uh, with the vision of Laudato Si can begin to create models that are attractive and which teach, um, because that's in a way what the mission needs to be. But I think separately, that all sorts of things have to happen. What you're talking about, we need government policies uh, that help to pre uh, shape this, there are all sorts of other discussions to have about policy and about the big scale. But I think what we're concentrating here on is how do we create these new models that are visible and act as signs and that show that it's possible to be regenerative and profitable uh, and create good human uh, communities, uh, which become signs. Thank you very much, uh, Austin and Alejandro. And as we have only three minutes left, um, we are like, Emmanuel, I see your hand uh, um, that you want to share something. So like, please, if you can like be uh, brief and then we will uh, wrap up and close the, the webinar together. One brief comment I wanted to add to what Austin was saying about regenerative agriculture, especially from the global South. Uh, one dimension that I see at Bethany Land Institute is how the young people are also involved in recovering uh, indigenous seeds and the indigenous varieties that have been on the verge of extinction as they kind of really feel the assault of this huge, big industrial farming uh, machinery and, and, and pressure. And there's been a lot of, uh, in a way, excitement about in a way, preserving and recovering those native indigenous seeds that are more resistant to uh, pest, uh, to, to disease, to, to pests, but also in terms of adding nutrition value. So adding to the kind of the food bank with all these sorts of local varieties, I think that is a great contribution to humanity and the way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Father Emmanuel. And, um, and then I will give the word to, to Austin to say a final words on this uh, second webinar that we are doing in the Laudato Si week. That is what does a Laudato Si farm look like? Well, and thank you. Software. Thank you again, um, Maria Virginia Mateusz uh, for hosting this. Thank you for the, to the farmer Francesco. Thank you to Father Emmanuel, who's um, given us a wonderful example of this happening. And so many different contributions uh, that have been very important. I want to end just with this question. Who is interested in pursuing this conversation? Who is interested in drawing up a model, uh, a business plan that begins with these principles? 
Uh, I think it's a great project and I'd quite like to know if any of you would like to take this on. Uh, and if so, please count on my support and I would love to help in any way I can. But I want to suggest that this is the action that should flow from this. Thank you very much, Austin, and thank you very much to everyone today, to all the discussants, and we uh, hope to see you soon in our next webinar. Happy Laudato Si Week. Thank bye you, all of you. Thank you very much, bye everybody. Bye. Meet you. Let's thank continue you. the conversation.